So welcome everybody. I'm Rebecca. I am the communications wizard here at Round Sky, and I'm really excited to discuss collaborative meeting hacks with you all. And first off, I will start sharing my screen so that we can all be on the same page, literally. Okay. Share. All right. So, great. So you're in the right place. So I'll tell you first a little bit about Round Sky. Round Sky is a worker owned cooperative that works with leaders, aspiring leaders and organizations that value and want to improve their democratic and collaborative processes in their teams and hone in on their leadership potential at the same time. And we do that through courses, coaching, and team or company-based trainings grounded in our collaborative operating system and processes, which we call CoLab. And you'll hear a lot more about that system throughout this webinar, and the tips are really based on that. Uh, so from there, I would love to hear a little bit more about who's on this call. And so I'd like to invite you to use the chat box, which you'll find in the toolbar, a little speaking bubble. On my page, it's on the left bottom corner or the right bottom corner, but it may be on top depending on how your, your screen is oriented. And I'll just start off with a hello and maybe it'll pop up for you. So if you could introduce your name and the place that you're coming from today, maybe the city, town, and a few words about what brought you to this webinar. And I'll kind of share them out as we go. If you're having trouble finding it, let me know. I've also found that Zoom isn't ex very instant. So, okay, great. So, hi, this is Melissa in Heinsberg, Vermont. Sorry if I said that wrong. Always interested in facilitating better meetings and doing a better job working with groups and clients. Nice, welcome. Joshua's coming from Boston, part of a nonprofit that has land in Cherry Plain in upstate New York called Ancestral Wisdom Bridge. And their mission is to empower, moving around a bit, empower people through practicing and sharing the indigenous spirit technologies of the Zagara tribe. Sorry if I said that wrong, of West Africa, welcome. Ashley is calling from Oakland and has been working to support worker-owned co-ops for several years. Nice, welcome. And uh, lots of business meet, Josh was coming from lots of business meetings, great. And Draft is here on a world trip to meet activists of the world working on open app ecosystem to enable the creation of the next economic and social system. Great. And keep introducing yourselves. Uh, say hello to each other if you'd like. And while you do that, I will introduce myself a bit more. So that's me. And like I said, I'm Rebecca, the communications wizard here at Round Sky. And I've been working with these awesome folks for a year last week. Um, and what brought me to this work is the importance of process and structure to get us where we want to be. And I also wanted to enter more fully into the worker co-op movement to gain a better understanding of what economic justice looks like for me as I come from a fragmented class background. And I currently live and have lived in New Orleans for about four years and I'm originally from California. And outside of Round Sky, I do anti-racist organizing with the collective, uh, try to make time for dancing and visit my folks in California as often as I can. And like I said earlier, I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation today because I've experienced some pretty awful and even uh, comical meetings 
and also some really inspiring meetings. So really happy to dig into this. And today's webinar will be led by Cecile and I'll let her introduce herself to you all and tell us a little bit more about what brought this topic about collaborative meetings up for her. Thanks, Rebecca, and uh, thanks everyone. I'm, I'm Cecile, one of the co-founders of Round Sky Solutions, and I live near Montpelier, Vermont. I've been a social entrepreneur for 30 years and have experienced a lot of challenging meetings that came out of and contributed to painful working experiences. Uh, motivated by the waste of time, energy, and creativity that bad meetings represent, I was inspired to take up a deep dive into organizational and individual development in search of an answer. And in particular, I was curious about what power is and developed some theories about power to map or explain the dynamics I commonly saw in organizations. I synthesized this research I've been doing with my challenging career experiences, and from that, research, I created a map of what organizations are already talking about and need to communicate about, and a set of processes called CoLab that reliably deliver healthy forms of power in action, including much more fun, engaging, and productive meetings. And I published this work in Collaboration That Works, a ruthlessly practical handbook for a generative world. And it's a, basically a training manual that summarizes the research and introduces CoLab for organizations. So I'm delighted to be here with you today to explore ways of actively transcending bad meeting culture. Today we're going to start by looking at why effective collaborative meetings are so important, followed up by an introduction to four hacks for getting engagement and efficiency in your meetings. And after today's webinar, we'll be sending you templates and flowcharts you can use in your meetings. And we'll wrap up with some next steps you can consider uh, before wrapping up with a, a Q&A question and answer for everyone. So back to Rebecca on logistics. Great. And so now moving to some more logistics about the webinar. If you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box. And uh, the same one that you use to introduce yourself. There's also a function where you can, if you're having technical issues, you can ask the host, me specifically, for help. And I will try to do my best to help you. And this webinar will also be recorded, so and it is right now. So if you shared and shared with you along with the resources after this meeting. So if there's anything um, that you want taken out, please let us know. Great. So I'll stop there. And before we launch into the content of the webinar, I wanted to invite those of you on the call to tell us a bit more about how you've experienced meetings in your life, both um, the great parts and the, the not great parts. You can just put that right in the chat box. And Joshua, I can definitely send the title out of the title of the book out to you with the rest of the information after the webinar. Mm -hmm. So what, what are the first words that come up in your mind when you think about meetings? What brought you here? Nothing. Is it? <laughs> While you all think about what comes up for you, I'll share something. I've had some meetings in um, nonprofits for work for them for years and they never took notes at the meeting. And I didn't know that that was a terrible idea until I worked for a company that did. I was like, wow, that saves a lot of time. Um, and then we have re redressing destructive power dynamics between the CEO and employees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unproductive meetings, the same people doing all the talking. Yes. Necessary but inefficient. That meetings are necessary but inefficient. Yeah. Ashley says that she's experienced all sorts of meetings. And um, 
As a co-owner of a business, curious about how to balance keeping up efficiency but cultivating space to dive into topics that need time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like more complex things or maybe more um, sensitive or tender topics that come up in our work because we're there 40 plus hours a week. Absolutely. Great, well, we'll be addressing some of these experiences today and feel free to keep adding them in as they come to you. And so with that, I'll um, pass it back to Cecile. Yeah, wow, so many of us have experienced frustrating or even terrible meetings and thank you all for your examples just now. Just to name a few top examples from my experience, People getting offended and even defensive um, in meetings. So even if this is subtle, it reveals the underlying difficulties that can get in the way of doing good work together. Uh, another one, people being accusatory and snide. If it's not subtle, then disagreements can come out more direct, uh, more directly, which further undermines our ability to work together. People disengaging during the meetings and then at all times. Our meeting culture really spills over into every part of our work life. And if you've got a bad meeting culture, then you can expect disengagement on some level or another. Also updates that go on forever and are not helpful. Um, you know, short, succinct and relevant updates from our teammates are essential to doing good work together. And when we don't get that, it's really hard to work well. A few people who have too much responsibility can lead to any number of workplace dysfunctions. Also, a few people doing all the talking, which further imbalances perspectives and investment. Someone else just mentioned that. Uh, Well-intentioned people delivering inconsistent accountability. If people are taking on projects and then forgetting about them or not making any progress, the sense of floundering as a team increases. Also, agenda items that only reflect the needs of a few. Uh, most meeting cultures preference the manager or the team leads perspectives, and while a team lead might have more on their mind, they will have more on their mind. Uh, not requesting input from all team members as we build the agenda leads to lost opportunities for team improvement and engagement. Also agenda items that take way too long and don't lead to meaningful items that move things forward. It's also another really common mistake, which is difficult to surmount without an effective process that the whole team knows and understands and is using. Also meetings with no clear ending that drag on for hours and, and really the list goes on. These are just a few. And I wanted to spend just a couple minutes talking about the consequences of this since bad meeting culture is so endemic, it's easy to think that it's normal or unavoidable. Someone said necessary but inefficient, right? So they, we do have to have meetings, um, but, it's, but it's not necessary or unavoidable that they be bad. And I'm here to tell you that they may be normal, meaning that they happen all the time in all kinds of organizations. Bad meetings are not healthy and they are entirely avoidable. Um, the problem with accepting bad meeting culture is that, first of all, it saps organizational energy and focus. There's nothing like an argument in the middle of a meeting for making everything worse. They also waste time. Meetings are the most efficient way to sync up and align. And when they're wasted with no clear decisions or next actions, people still have to obtain that information or risk doing bad or useless work. And then they have to run around and get that information and that is a double waste of time, essentially. Another reason, uh, sense of being stuck increases. Leaves people feeling powerless and frustrated, leading to disengagement. Also underscores the sense of being overworked and underappreciated, uh, where we don't have a good mechanism for redistributing work because we can't really see what other people are doing or not doing. It's easy for people to feel unseen and unappreciated for their work. It also makes it harder to address important issues and get good work done. Um, when meetings are wasted on conversations that go on way past the point of usefulness for the organization, the time we have left to discuss and decide on important issues really dwindles. So let's just touch base briefly on some of the benefits of getting effective collaborative meetings. Um, it can be challenging to get there, but well worth the effort. Imagine what it might be like for you to have an organization full of inspiring leaders with tools that enable you to hack meetings into flows and effective outcomes. Well, for one thing, improving your meetings will save you time and energy and open up the space for everyone on the team to be more of their full selves, 
which simply feels better and frankly gets better results. Um, so you can look forward to these things. Engaging in efficient, collaboratively led meetings. And I'm gonna read these quotes for those who are listening on audio only, uh, but these are from clients and students of ours. Organizational conversations now happen significantly more efficiently and in ways that are safe, well held and invite the participation of all involved. I have had many experiences of dysfunctional organizations having circular conversations and the decades of experience synthesized into CoLab gives me tools to short circuit those loops and move a group towards high functionality, collective alignment and success. So the power and joy and fulfillment that come from productive efficient meetings goes on to infuse all the work we do with that same motivating force, bringing much more meaning and productivity to everything that we do. So another benefit is being able to work together productively with flow and satisfaction. I now feel invigorated and excited to work with my business partners and our work contributes to a meaningful practice of providing service to others while also caring for ourselves. Without this new framework and tools, I would not be in this position. And that's from a worker co-op. So yeah, working in collaboration with others can be profoundly frustrating. And that frustration is simply a drain on both organization and individual. Getting to flow and satisfaction produce a host of benefits, including longevity. In other words, people sticking around to contribute to an organization's success. So next benefit, not getting stuck on issues. So it's uh, really hard when we just feel like we're going in circles. Um, with your guidance, you turn what could have been at best a jumbled waste of time or perhaps worse, a clash of perspectives into a constructive reorientation of the focus of the group. In my mind, that was a turning point for the productivity of our team and the success of our work, not from Marlboro College. So yeah, the feeling of being stuck in one's work with others is corrosive, especially if it's a consistent feature of meetings. Um, being able to move forward even on difficult issues is like opening the windows in a room and letting the light and air in. Another benefit, uh, better innovation and problem solving. So this from a general manager, we were exposed to a new process that allowed us to articulate and discuss our multiple perspectives on tensions or the problems on the job without actually getting tense and with a refreshing objectivity. It allowed everyone to articulate and really hear one another's perspective, take ownership of resolution and identify areas of commonality. Discovering a new framework for problem solving that showed potential for effectiveness and efficiency was pretty exciting. So yeah, it's exciting to work together and face challenges and surmount them. Uh, being equipped to do so not only efficiently, but with creativity and innovation is critical to organizational success, especially in these complex and kind of constantly changing business environments that we all find ourselves in today. Another benefit is accessing mutual support and accountability. So there's another quote, um, Kolar proved to be the exact prescription necessary to aid us in our problems of inefficiency, lack of accountability, unclear roles and management structure. The system has organic roots that speak to the basics of human organization while simultaneously embracing technologies that allow us to prioritize and systematize in our daily lives. I found these techniques to be very straightforward and succinct while allowing for necessary flexibility. And this is from an owner of a tea room. Uh, one of, so yeah, one of the biggest challenges of collaborative work environments where we are explicitly sharing power is accountability, uh, both how we support each other in getting our work done and how we hold each other accountable in that process. And this next one is one of my favorites, a real distribution of power and voice. Um, this one is huge. If you really wanna get innovating and feel some meaningful engagement from your team, try giving them real power. And here's a testimonial from um, a radio station that we trained uh, from a manager there. I just wanted to say that adopting the tools you trained us with has really changed how my team operates. I know others here can say the same, but specifically for my team, it has been invaluable. These tools give everyone on my team a mechanism to air any issue, tension, question, frustration, or idea. And the open voting ensures that the most important topics get the most time. It also helps me, my team hold me, the director, accountable. I can't simply ignore issues or questions even if I wanted to, I don't. 
uh, because they keep adding to it and voting it up for discussion. And meaningful, satisfying participation, a huge benefit. A quote from one of our own Charlotte Root, a level two certified collab facilitator, and she says, I can honestly say that my work with Round Sky has changed my life. I've learned the joy and power of leadership, shared leadership, greatly expanded my ability to stay organized and deliver on my own goals and learn so much about myself and others and our differing perspectives and how to understand and work with that more effectively. And I continue to grow into an easeful relationship with facilitating organizations through decision-making processes. And really for me, the, the best part about having learned all this is that I've been able to use these skills over and over again in all kinds of different contexts. And you can too. It's kind of like having cracked the co collaboration code and having some superpowers for enabling people to get along and do better work together. So today I'm going to show you four hacks out of dozens that we've researched and synthesized into the collaborative operating system that we call Colab. And these are the top four that we recommend getting started with. We hope you give them a try. However, implementing this stuff in organizations can be a tricky affair. Every organization is unique. So we recommend you consider further training and support during a transition like this. So after our first hack, um, the living agenda. One of the simplest and easiest places to start is what we call the living agenda. It's a simple Google Doc shared with all members of the team and used as a visual reference during the meetings by all team members. So even if you're in person, this doc can be there informing everyone as to what's proceeding. And as the name suggests, this document becomes a repository of meeting outcomes with one date stacked upon the next with the most recent at the top. As a Google Doc, it's searchable, available all to all team members in real time. One of the benefits of a real-time visual reference is that we all get to see the outcomes being recorded. This makes it much more clear that we're not moving on from one item to the next until we've recorded a clear decision or next action. Those decisions and next actions can be color-coded for ease of reference, and the simple, use of, you know, this, the simple use of this doc uh, can keep your conversations focused and targeted on outcomes. It also means that one person can't just derail a conversation that's underway because the expectation is that we complete one item, including recording outcomes that everyone can see and consent on before we move to the next. So we've developed a template for you to use and we're we'll sending that out in the follow-up email. Uh, feel free to make a copy, make use of it in your next team meeting. We recommend you use the template for the standard meeting practice at the top and copy and paste that down for each instance of a meeting, changing the title to reflect the date. So hack number two, another benefit of the living agenda is that it offers a template for your meeting practice that standardizes how meetings are held. There's a lot of information that goes into each of the steps of what we call the standard meeting practice, which you can learn more about in our, our sliding scale course, and we'll be sending you out a template after the call. But the key here is having a repeatable process for your meetings that is clear, fair, and transparent. This streamlines people's expectations for meetings, making it much easier to participate in a generative way. In addition, our research has, and testing has shown that meetings flow much more easily when there's an elected facilitator whose job it is to take us through the steps of the meeting process, and an elected scribe whose job it is to record the clear outcomes of the agenda items in the living agenda where everyone can see them. When you elect your facilitator, keep in mind that it's much better not to have the manager or team lead be the facilitator, and, and here's why. The manager or team lead already has a lot of power. So does a facilitator. And combining the two centers of power in one person often results in meetings being skewed to represent that one person's perspective and desires. This leads to disengagement and lack of incremental improvement outside of that one person's ideas. So the scribe role is also vital because how information is recorded and therefore remembered is a locus of power. Having elected one scribe also means that we know whose job it is to write on the living agenda. 
having many scribes in a meeting, I can attest to this, is an invitation to confusion, argument, and frustration. So yeah, one person in charge of those details. And give them the power to step in and request a clear outcome of an agenda item before moving on if that's needed. So on to hack number three, integrative consent. The third hack that we want to share with you is the power of a clear, efficient, and effective collaborative decision-making process. So many issues can be solved when how we make decisions is clear to everyone, fair so all can participate, and efficient so we can make decisions together rapidly rather than have them drag on interminably. The other benefit to a clear collaborative decision-making process is that it distributes power to all members of the team rather than having just one person, again, often the manager, making all the decisions. So we'd like to offer you the model for collaborative decision-making that we use called integrative consent, and we'll be sending out a flow chart for it in our follow-up email. And we hope you give it a try. Uh, you, one of the secret ingredients in making integrative consent really work well, uh, we're going to share with you in our hack number four. So keep that in mind when you're practicing integrative consent. So in order to introduce you to this hack, I need to share what we mean by attention in this context. We use the term tension to indicate any difference between where we are as a team today and where we could be. This could be a better idea for how we do something or an issue that's getting in the way of good work being done. So the term is not just negative, although it's also fundamentally positive because we're inviting all the teammates to sense what's in the way of doing their work better and bring that to the meeting agenda. We recommend building your meeting agenda from the tensions of everyone present, not just the manager or team lead, when you allocate agenda building to one or a few, the opportunity to harness the collective intelligence of your team is lost. Even if you as an agenda builder kind of go around and ask people before the meeting what's on their mind. So this is a subtle shift, but it's profound and it can take a few weeks or months of practice to produce engagement, but it will do so. So build your meeting agendas from the tensions of all present and then invite your team members to vote on those tensions according to which ones they feel are most important to this particular meeting. The facilitator then uses that information to choose an order of agenda items. In addition, as agenda items are placed on it, have the person raising that tension put their initials on the item. This is critical because the per that person then becomes the tension holder of that item, which means they carry a special role during the processing of that item to identify the outcomes that will incrementally move their tension forward and to do so as rapidly as possible. So in other words, it's not up to the team lead or anyone else on the team to decide if the outcome works for now. It belongs to the tension holder. So for example, and to reference hack number three, when an item requires a decision, that tension holder is responsible for crafting a proposal for the decision and making amendments to it prior to the objection round. This is hugely streamlining and simplifying. If we don't have a tension holder who has this kind of power in a team meeting, items tend to drag on for much longer than is helpful or necessary. So I'd like to just summarize these four hacks. First of all, Create and use a living agenda for all your meetings. Make sure it's available to all your teammates. Use the standard meeting practice and elect a scribe and facilitator. Use integrative consent or another clear, effective, collaborative decision-making process. And build your agenda from all present, asking them to act as tension holders when it's their item. So I hope you can see how easy it is actually to get engaging collaborative meetings that don't suck when you know what goes into it. And I'd like to take a few minutes, um, Rebecca is going to help me out with this too, to tell you about an opportunity to learn how to do this through our online course, uh, CoLab 101, which is available on a sliding scale for a limited time. In this self-serve course, you really learn how to use our system and that taps into the brilliance of your team, enables you to master how to lead engaging collaborative meetings. And this course also helps you build your, your facilitative confidence um, and increase your team's growth, vision, and ability to resolve conflict together. So Collab 101 provides you with the necessary skills and practices to communicate effectively within your team. 
And I'm going to pass uh, this off to Rebecca, who's going to share just a little bit more about what we get into in the lessons. Great. Thanks, Cecile. I think um, those four hacks are more like eight. There's so much wrapped into each one. So I really look forward to hearing what comes out of this for people. Um, and I'll, I want to cover a little bit about what CoLab 101 offers in terms of the tools and values so you can see if this is for you. And then afterwards, we'll take some questions. So I'm just going to go through um, these different lessons so you, you can get a sense of what, what happens in CoLab 101. And I'm also noticing that there are some folks on the call here in CoLab 101. So if you want to say anything in the chat box, feel free to do that. Um, so starting with lesson one, um, in lesson one, you'll get a full introduction to CoLab and the course itself, and you'll really be able to explore the different power dynamics and how they show up in your organization through the power matrix. And uh, we'll also show you how to build effective, inclusive, mission-driven, power sharing, all those good things, organizations and teams through the seven conversations, which you'll probably already having some of them, but it's good to make them explicit. Um, and then we go into personal development. So we take up um, how, what it means to build your skills as a facilitative leader, where you'll gain an understanding of what personal development or what we call PD is and why it's essential to do in collaborative work in organizations and teams, and also learn some key frameworks and tools for self-awareness, understanding, and growth. Um, that will support you in becoming a more compassionate, creative, and effective team member through building that, those relationships together with yourself, really. And then we talk about facilitation. So we dig in into how to guide your meetings through a democratic process uh, with clarity and action. And you'll understand practices that increase engagement and enjoyment in your meetings through the different agenda building processes. And you'll reduce time spent in meetings through integrative consent, that decision making process. And we'll go over that more. And also um, develop your skills to facilitate meetings with clear next actions and alignment. So you know what just happened when you left a meeting. It doesn't seem like you spent all this time and you don't know if any decisions were made which is really frustrating, um, can speak from experience. <laughs> and so then we get into scribing. There's a lot of power in, in being able to put down what your team decides and what the next actions are. So we'll talk about how to do that with um, the least effort and maximum impact, not writing down what everyone says. And you'll receive access to the different templates and how to, and understanding of how to use them uh, for to build collective and individual accountability. That's a big thing that comes up in teams is how to keep people accountable. And part of that is scribe. And we'll integrate tracking as a participatory leadership practice and get into what transparency and openness really means for it, your team. And then We'll dive deeper into integrative consent and, and collective decision making and how that is used to really manage and use conflict to, that is inevitable to your advantage and making your team stronger. And we'll get into the nitty gritty of what integrative consent is or what collective decision making means. It's not always the funnest thing, but when you have a process that you can trust um, you'll get out of it much, get out of those complex decisions much more easily. And um, build your confidence to facilitate these meetings that you're having on your team with, with all the things that are going on. And then we're, we're more than halfway through, so there's a lot here, but there's just a, a few more lessons that I'll go over. So we really also talk about the importance of being clear about your roles and distributing power through that. Um, often in teams and meetings, someone is doing all the reporting because they're doing all the work. So roles is really important for getting clear on that. Um, and the power dynamics that you're seeing in your meetings can often be cleared up through roles 
and being clear about who's doing what. So you're not battling over a decision that maybe someone can just make that. And you'll, you'll get a sense of how to do that. And then we'll talk about accountability on a whole lesson for it and how to keep your team on track and also keep them self-organized. A collaborative team isn't one person telling everyone what to do, it's that self-organization and you'll get um, some really useful basic templates to start using. And then we'll, we'll end the, we end Collab 101 with our last lesson on how to really open up your books and get cross organizational shared leadership, which we believe is uh, part of transparency and developing your vision, mission, and values together. Um, and also getting a sense of how to resolve that interpersonal conflict that's happening in your team when somebody did something you spend 40 plus hours a week together, so it makes sense that conflict comes up. So you, you wanna be able to um, not ignore the elephant in the room, right? Okay. So through the course, uh, people have said that they can better communicate with clarity, facilitate fun and effective meetings, which is what this is all about today and where a lot of our work happens and um, manage power dynamics in the moment through all of these different tools. They're really about power. That's what Collab is really based on, is redistributing power and, and acknowledging the different power dynamics that exist. And um, being able to sort and process different issues efficiently. Sometimes some things need a conversation and some just need a next action or a, a agreement um, on a policy or whatever you call it in your team. And reduced time spent in meetings because you're getting a bit more efficient. You don't have to go over things all over again. You'll learn what to track and why and how you'll work together productively with flow and satisfaction most of the time. Um, you will become robots, so most of the time. And then you'll get better at innovating problem solving, problem solving together and um, you'll really get a sense of what accountability means. I often in organizing spaces, um, it's thrown around, but sometimes we don't know what it means to be accountable. And so you get more clear about what that means for in your team, what that looks like. Um, and you'll use these skills over and over again, right? You'll realize that you're using them in different meetings. I was at a meeting on Sunday, not related to Round Sky, and my friend was like, oh, this meeting is very round sky. It's like, oh, is that good? So um, some, of the, some of the things that I'm really excited about are we'll get the instructional manual, which kind of is a step-by-step -step process of all of these things. And you'll, you get two free coaching calls. And we have two every two a month live training calls. So if you're having questions, you can bring them up to the team and write like, Cecile said earlier, it's on a sliding scale right now. So it's originally um, three, $295, but we're making it as low as $10 or whatever you can afford um, a sliding scale, your choice, because this is, these resources are important. So we've decided to do that for the summer and maybe beyond. And that's the link, Solutions dot com slash collab dash 101 so we'd love to see you there and like i said earlier if anyone in the course wants to say anything you don't have to but if you want to you can um and then we're going to get into some of these questions and answers that you have so there's one one question that's already been posted by joshua and here that cecile perhaps you can answer is um how do we allow spirit, which is unpredictable and outside of logic, to flow with us in a business meeting rather than having it just confuse things? Mm, wonderful question, Joshua. I would, I would offer that the inspiration that, that spirit brings, if, if you define it as kind of outside logic, um, is the ability of any of us to 
um, really attend to what's under discussion and bring our best wisdom forward that's in, informed by the inspiration of spirit. Um, so there's lots of discussion that happens um, during well-facilitated meetings, and that's a great time to bring insights and, and ideas forward that may be uh, perhaps more informed by, by spirit rather than sort of a logic. The other thing I just want to say is that even though um, there is a structure to the meeting, that structure itself can be changed as long as the team consents to it. So that could be a proposal from someone who's sensing that something else might be really helpful for the meetings. They could put that up and have another type of meeting structure added to the, the basic backbone of the standard meeting practice. So there's a lot of different ways in which it can um, influence and, and certainly be present at, at all times uh, during a meeting. So if you wanna clarify what your question is any further, Joshua, I'd be happy to, uh, happy to address that. But that's, uh, that's been my experience so far, is that it's actually really, really rich and easier to access that um, unpredictable outside of logic space when I know what I'm to expect in a meeting and um, I, can, I can sort of set aside um, my concerns and, and really show up fully. Yeah, and if I might add something to that, I think there's, there's something about uh, just naming it as being a part of the process, right? I one of the meeting that I had facilitated is around our ancestry, like talking about our ancestry. And part of that is allowing the space for it. And you decide what container you'll allow it in, whether it's a, a story circle, standard meeting practice, you decide what the, the container is. So nice. this is a container. That spirit is definitely could, could be allowed in if that's a part of your culture, of your meetings. And um, just a reminder, you can post your questions in the chat box if you have questions about collaborative meeting hacks, about our, our services, what, what we do, where we're coming from. And there's one coming in here. Um, I work in a conventional company, not a cooperative, where the CEO founder has ultimate decision-making power, not the team. They're open to some of the PVC profit voting culture principles, particularly around culture. Do you have any recommendations for maximizing collaborative decision-making within an autocracy? <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah, I, I do. Um, so uh, the, the basic principle to follow here is uh, have a conversation with your CEO and define the boundaries of autonomy. So what I mean by that is if you have a team that's, whose job it is to do work on X, Y, or Z, then get a written um, statement about what the work of the team is and um, consent to that with your with your CEO and, and wordsmith it if you need to with them, but basically identify explicitly in writing what is the work of this team and ask your CEO to grant you the power to make decisions about your scope of work. That's the specific work that you guys are accountable for um, using integrative consent or some other decision making process. And that if that CEO really has issues with whatever decisions um, that are going to be made by that team, they can always bring it back up for revisiting. But that sort of leaves the team with a little bit of um, freedom to make the decisions around their scope of work. Um, I am assuming that the CEO is not showing up in those meetings. If they are also showing up in those meetings, then again, a, a process like integrative consent would be a very effective way of getting both the CEO's perspective and everyone else's. Um, so it's, it's, not, um, it's not just one person who's, who's making decisions in that and using that type of process. Um, if you want to um, ask more questions about that, feel free, but the basic concept is create a little bubble of autonomy as much as you can get from your CEO, and it's, you know, it's up to them. If they want to define it more largely or smallly, that's fine, but whatever realm they're willing to give you room to, uh, room to roam in, uh, get that clear, and then, then go off and do it. 
Great. Thanks. Which I'm sure that question relates to a lot of people on this call. Um, absolutely. And another question came in. What is the best way to determine length of time per agenda item beforehand? Mm. Great question. Thank you. And I actually don't recommend doing that. Uh, it may sound counterintuitive, but the, um, the trouble with having explicit time frames for an agenda item ahead of time is that you're really assuming you know exactly how long resolving that issue is going to take. What if it takes half the time? Um, what if it needs just another minute to come to resolution? So what I suggest instead of assigning times is to use the voting process on your agenda items to front load the items that are most important. And then mo you know, the most uh, significant point of leverage is to have an effective process for taking those items to resolution, to a clear recordable outcome. Um, and and that's, um, that's some of the, what we teach in CoLab 101. There, there's a lot of really important information about how to focus people's conversations, how to identify, for example, is this an item that needs a decision or is this an item that simply needs a next action? Um, because you don't have to make decisions about everything and being clear about where that boundary lies will make you much more efficient in processing your agenda items. So I've I've been in meetings, I've attended meetings where we got through like 29 agenda items. Um, so it's entirely possible to be very, very efficient with your items once you know how to do that. And I recommend that over assigning times. Um, yeah, actually tend to be more efficient uh, just uh, using this alternative way of keeping things efficient and on track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if I'll just add something to that um, is I would more use the time that you have to decide how much time you put into the agenda items and maybe it's how far you get through it. How far do you get through that tension? Because you can't solve everything in one meeting all the time. So how do you just move it a little bit forward so it at least gets attention and you can keep working on it over time? Yeah, I'll, I'll thank you, Rebecca. That's actually a super important um, kind of basic underlying principle to how to process agenda items is that you're looking for what is minimally sufficient. Um, what's going to incrementally move attention forward, not, you know, resolve it forever. Uh, that really is a very different place to work from. And thanks, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, well, we have time for a few more questions. And another one came in, how do you increase participation by introverts? <laughs> nice, nice, well, I'm an introvert. <laughs> so uh, it, on some level, I built this practice for me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it, it, I, definitely my, I, I influenced it, but, um, but yeah, I'm, I mean, introverts really do struggle in, in a lot of meeting um, contexts because, consideration is really not given to the difference in communication style and preferences. So uh, the, the way that we specifically encourage um, sort of a balance between people who talk too much and perhaps those who talk too little is to use specific rounds at various points. So for example, we've talked a bit about agenda building in this call. Um, agenda building isn't done just whoever speaks up, it's done one person at a time. So we are literally going around to everyone. And if I have nothing to say, I'll say that, I'm, I'm good. Um, but if I do, then I have an explicit moment where I can step in as opposed to having to speak over someone to get my voice heard. Mm -hmm. um, so those rounds are really helpful and we use them not just with agenda building, but also with um, within the decision-making process. and. Um, it's, it, it works quite well um, for it, at least that, that factor of being an introvert, which is, you know, not wanting, at least in my case, not wanting to speak over other people. Um, so one other uh, feature of some types of introversion is that uh, we need time to process what's happened and think and, and have time to sit with it and just like see what happens. Um, and, and come back to it at a later point. And so making decisions on the spot can be really difficult or um, 
just create a, a discomfort in introverts because they're, they're not sure, they're not ready to make a decision. So the, the piece of CoLab that helps with that is that we, um, we have an explicit agreement that any decision can be revisited at any time. In fact, any tension can be revisited at any time. And so even if we do make a decision, it's good enough for now. And we'll, if, if any one of the team members that say an introvert, you know, over the weekend comes up with a better idea, they can put it right back on, we can get it resolved and move on. So it's not like um, there's a, there's a hard, um, we're done with this item when we're finished. We are incrementally moving it forward. And that's just a very different space that opens up room for um, more thinking and processing to happen afterwards. Anything you thought of, Rebecca? That all sounds great. I'm also introvert-ish. <laughs> I think I'm, I, I need both. Yeah. I have moments of needing people and moments of, no, <laughs> I can, I can work remotely. So I think that means I have lots of introvert in me. Um, but that sounds, that's, I have nothing to add. Um, there's one more question that we'll cover and, um, it's the, the intro is a little bit long, so I'll just read it out for everyone. Um, it's a follow-up on the spirit, the question about spirit. And hmm. So the other part of things that's coming to mind is that we are attempting to open a vastly different culture and perspective perception of spirit. The Degara don't really do a lot of meetings. Their system is really simple. They only meet when there's something that isn't being decided by divination or custom or spirit saying it. Only the elders speak and only those who are on the council. If you're on the council, you have a stone to sit on and in the circle. And if you aren't on a stone, then you don't get to speak. That's as much structure as seems to be compatible with a culture of so much everyday conversation with spirit. We in our organization, on the other hand, seem to keep falling into business meetings. How do we translate a structure like theirs or yours to fit with our situation and spirit's viewpoint? Hmm. Also, we're all volunteers and we only show up when we show up. We're not together 40 hours a week, more like five hours a month usually. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. That's great. Well, a couple of things I'll point out um, that are, that are similar, first of all, between CoLab and the model that you're um, speaking to here is that only the people that are in a scope of work have a chance to speak. So um, if you are not attending to a particular body of work, uh, then you um, are not invited essentially to participate in the meetings. So we want to focus meetings around a scope of work. And in particular, one of the other things you mentioned is that they don't really meet unless there's something that does need to be discussed. And the same is, is true with CoLab. We really focus things around what's needed as opposed to um, other things and, or just meeting because we have to, um, or we said we would. Um, so there is that sort of sensing, constant sensing into what's needed and what's best. And, uh, you know, shortening our meetings if we only have a couple agenda items um, and, you know, scheduling, uh, canceling them or scheduling them in an ad hoc way. And that's all based on that intuition and that sense of what's needed rather than what the schedule is. So for example, um, so we're kind of blending the two in the sense that we're saying, yeah, that if you're working together, even if you are volunteers and are only, you know, showing up occasionally, in order to do work, we have to communicate. It's actually not really an option to try to work with anyone else and not communicate about what we're doing at some point or who's doing what and all of that. So the um, having a clear structure, but a minimally sufficient structure to how to hold those conversations is, is really allows for this other um, part of who we are, um, you might call that spirit, to really, to really show up much more fully. Um, rather than being constrained by the expectations that most business meetings perhaps have. Um, and, um, and also I would say that, that having a practice where uh, you're invited to speak if you have something or not um, is also similar. You know, we're asking each person at every moment in the meeting to be attentive to what they sense is really needed. 
for the for the greater good. Um, so those are those are a few thoughts for you. I'll just add that it is hard to work with volunteers who are only doing a few hours a week or a month, um, and that's challenging. But it's almost even more important to have good, effective, clear, concise meetings under those circumstances because otherwise the um, the lack of being in sync with each other um, can be really, really frustrating and demotivating. And frankly, you can lose volunteers just back, back based on lack of clarity um, and lack of progress. So those are a few thoughts. Yeah, I might just add one thing is that you can change your, your meeting practice to add in whatever that key question is for you. Like if you don't want it to be all business in your meetings. That's, that's the sense I'm getting from this is that maybe you add a, a section in the, in your sessions or meetings together that really talks about the key, like the principles or the values that are guiding you and like just diving deeper into those um, during that session. Or maybe it's that, that community building activity that you're doing together. Yeah. So, I, I think you sh can shape your meetings to what you need yeah. out of it. Easier said than done, totally. But um, my sense of, is that would be the next part of the next step of meshing those two together. Um, and we'll take one more question. We have a minute left. And I think Cecile can answer this possibly quickly. <laughs> How can I cut someone who participates and talks too much um, but without being rude or sounding that I don't care about his participation? Nice. Yeah. That is a really um, tricky, tricky thing. So thanks for asking it. And I would, I would back us up to the structure of the process as the place to start. It's not the only thing. There's a number of steps um, to working with this. But the first place is to have an explicit meeting process with rounds so that and at, at key points so you don't do everything in a round but the rounds make it clear that they're not the only one who's going to talk we're going to move on to the next person now we'd like your opinion but we also want everyone else's um, so having that clear structure and expectation that we are going to hear from everyone enables you as the facilitator to step in and say let's say that person is going on longer than is really helpful um, during a round, you can step in and say, hey, it sounds like you're really saying this. Is that it? Okay, great, let's move on. We would like to hear from everyone else as well. Uh, so summarizing, um, and the other thing that this process, clear process does is it makes it clear if they are stepping in to speak when it's really not their turn, you can say, hey, thanks so much, but it's their turn right now. So it, it, it's not um, a, a personal attack on them, um, but it does redirect the conversation back to where the process is, is pointing you. Um, but again, the first place to start is a clear, explicit process so everyone understands the new set of expectations. And then as facilitator, your job is to step in and interrupt and redirect if needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I think, a very common question. We all have those moments. Yeah. on our teams, maybe even for ourselves. Um, so if you, thanks for asking it. And if uh, folks have other questions or wanna um, chat with us at all, these are our emails, Cecile at roundskysolutions.com or Rebecca at roundskysolutions.com. And I will be sending out this recording and the different templates to you all and some more information um, this week.